So I'm going to go ahead and get things uh, kicked off here about a minute early. Um, and again, if uh, as people come in, if you could just raise your hand uh, if you've got an empty spot next to you. We'll try to get as many people seated here as possible. Uh, so my name is Keith Maddox. Uh, I'm a senior engineering lead at Microsoft. I work on lots of open source projects um, in the networking space, such as uh, Istio, uh, Envoy Proxy, and of course, Gateway API. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was uh, one of the original uh, Gateway API mesh maintainers, and uh, still to this day, uh, contributes a good bit to the project to, to keep things moving forward. So really excited to talk to you about how to move from ingress to Gateway API with minimal hassle. So as you've probably heard by now, and I'm guessing based on a uh, number of you here, uh, you've heard about the fact that Gateway API uh, is in and Ingress is out, for lack of a better term. Uh, Gateway API is a new standard for layer seven traffic management in Kubernetes. Um, that doesn't mean that the Ingress API is going away. Um, many of you, again, if you're here for this talk, you're probably using Ingress somewhere in your Kubernetes clusters. In fact, raise your hand if you're still using the Ingress API in your clusters today. Lots and lots of you. Yeah, so never fear. Um, nothing's going to break. Ingress API is a, a V1 API in Kubernetes. It's not going away anytime soon. However, if you look at the, uh, at the, at the uh, Kubernetes documentation, uh, it's been mentioned that the Ingress API has been frozen. So no new features. Um, your Ingress API implementations should still be doing uh, CVE patches and things of that nature. Uh, but all new developments and new features um, and new energy is being moved towards the Gateway API. Uh, and in this talk, I'm not going to actually go through all the different features and uh, uh, the setup of Gateway API. There are lots of amazing speakers throughout this conference that have already spoken about Gateway API that are going to continue to speak about Gateway API. Uh, lots of previous talks at, uh, at previous conferences. Uh, so that's not what I'm going to do today. I'm going to leave let those other speakers uh, take care of you there. What I want to talk to you about is how to get to Gateway API if you're already using Ingress. Now. When you saw the title for this talk, um, and you made the decision to come here and listen to it, you probably thought about something like this, that, that there is going to be, um, this Keith guy is going to give me this one simple technique that's going to make this migration instant and painless, and you know, maybe I'll, you can become a um, little cool hacker dog uh, as well. But I, I regret to inform you that this is not that. Um, unfortunately, as with many things in technology, networking, uh, there's no simple solution uh, of anybody, uh, no, no super simple solution. There's always going to be some cost. Uh, if somebody's selling you a magic pill, you are going to want to ask them some more questions. Um, so I don't have a simple one-size-fits-all solution for migrating. What I do hope to leave you with today is a strategy to allow you to go into a migration process with a plan, to execute uh, and to hopefully be successful in migrating uh, from Ingress to Gateway API. I'm going to give you some tools, and uh, hopefully that will be helpful to you um, for going through uh, your own Ingress to Gateway API migration. So let's start with a high-level overview of the Ingress API. And even though we talk about Ingress API being one API, it's actually made up of two different resources. You've got the Ingress, which everybody here is probably most familiar with. Uh, that's the resource that describes the actual layer seven routing configuration for your application. And you see I've got an example here where you've got your, your Ingress. It's a typical Kubernetes resource. You've got your name. Um, you've got maybe some specific annotations, in this case, Nginx, um, that's doing a, a, tar a traffic rewrite to the um, to the root path. Uh, you're going to have rules to say, hey, if you're going to the, if you have a prefix of test path, you're going to go to this backend service on port 80. This is, uh, again, a very, by the way, can everybody hear me okay still? Are we, do we need to, are we good? Awesome. Uh, so this is a, a, an ingress resource. Uh, but the ingress API also includes another, maybe lesser known resource, to, especially to app developers, called ingress class. An ingress class uh, will register a specific controller to be able to monitor and act on your ingress resources. Um, and so what this API does at a high level is it's declarative configuration for you, uh, your app developers, uh, platform admins, to uh, 
write this configuration uh, to bring traffic into Kubernetes. Um, this, the thing actually moving the traffic, forwarding the packets, is usually a maybe a cloud float balancer. Uh, if you're doing bare metal, this might be something like Metal LB. Um, but there's going to be something moving packets into your cluster, and it needs to gain some context. Um, at that point, when you're going through the load balancer, all it knows is IP addresses. Right? It's just going to be you know, taking uh, a DNS name, turning it to an IP address, sending it to that load balancer, and the load balancer's got some decisions to make. And the load balancer makes those decisions based on the configuration that you're writing in these resources. And like I said earlier, this API was marked frozen, and I'll be uploading these slides to the Sketch platform later. You'll be able to see the actual documentation uh, where uh, you can you know, see where it's being marked as frozen. Um, and you know, it, like I said, new features are going to be developed in Gateway API exclusively. Um, one other thing about Ingress uh, is that it's not ideal for multi-tenants or multi-personas, multi-role environments. So. As your organization grows, as you have you know, more app developers, perhaps you have a platform team, you're trying to take advantage of a lot of these platform engineering um, processes that uh, you have been reading about and things like that. Well, Ingress API is not always the greatest option for that. Um, because you've got multiple ingresses that are merged together that might stomp on one another, um, it becomes really hard to be able to centrally manage that if you're a platform team and prevent um, app devs from doing things that might require uh, high privileges, perhaps, or do things that are destructive or right a route that breaks everything. Ingress doesn't have any controls or things like that built in that are aware of namespace, um, namespace granularity and RBAC and things like that. So that's a, kind of my high level overview of Ingress API. Um, there are lots of more in-depth guides out there, but this should be sufficient for this, this conversation. Uh, and this is how we typically see Ingress being applied, right? You've got uh, maybe a platform admin who's installing your Ingress controller. Um, they're going to install maybe Ingress Nginx or one other Ingress controller. Um, and they're going to be responsible for putting it in the Kubernetes, creating the Ingress class that's going to define, you know, basically register that controller and say that, hey, using if you see this Ingress class name in an Ingress resource, that's going to correspond to this controller somewhere. Uh, and then you uh, are going to usually have app devs or you know someone similar uh, creating ingress resources, maybe even one per app if the ingress controller supports merging um, for their application. This is the typical breakdown um, of how ingress API gets deployed. Now let's talk about the gateway API. Right. It's the successor to the Ingress API. It was built from the ground up uh, to support multiple personas. Um, one of the things that we see in software is that um, as we learn more, as the patterns emerge, and as the utilization of things like Kubernetes and cloud native development uh, grow across the industry, we're able to build software that takes into account those evolutions and the way that things have changed. And Gateway API is a fantastic example of that. Um, it was originally started around 2019, and at that time we saw that many companies, especially those who were growing uh, to, to, to massive scale, um, or even just going through a, you know, there's a small or medium-sized business who's having an influx of new customers, um, we saw these the uh, uh, the uh, the rise of centralized platform teams who had to administrate all of this stuff. And so Gateway API uh, takes all that into account and wants to make it easy for all of these different roles in an organization to coexist, um, not just coexist, but to thrive. And so the way this chart breaks down, this is from the Gateway API website, um, and you'll typically have an infrastructure provider that is going to provide a gateway class. These are the people who are maybe your uh, cluster admins. They're creating Kubernetes clusters in uh, Terraform or COPS or your cloud provider specific tooling. Um, and those folks are going to also be responsible for creating the gateway class. Uh, creating that gateway class is also going to have, uh, as part of it, installing a gateway controller. Similar to an ingress class, a gateway class represents a registration between a controller and a name that can be used in gateway resources. So once the infrastructure provider has created that gateway class, then a cluster operator is going to uh, create the gateway. Uh, now, again, in your organization, these might be the exact same people, uh, but sometimes the people who create the clusters aren't always the same as the people who are um, exposing traffic to uh, those clusters. And so these cluster operators are going to be the ones creating gateways. And when I say creating gateways, I mean actually creating a load balancer. Maybe you're doing them dynamically. 
maybe you are, um, there's this manual registration process where you are provisioning a new load balancer from a vendor. Um, and these cluster operators are responsible for um, taking that, that gateway, that infrastructure, that IP address, and associating it with a piece of com uh, compute within the Kubernetes cluster. And in Gateway API, uh, we map that via the gateway resource. The gateway resource corresponds to a piece of compute that is bringing traffic in, similar to Metal LB or um, Cloud Provider Load Balancer I mentioned earlier. And then we've got application developers, which are responsible for writing configuration just for their app. And so we've got a collection of resources um, that we call XRoute or um, you know, something like that, because they all begin, or they all end with the word route. <laughs> You've got HTTP route, here you see an example of a TLS route, also have a UDP route, a TCP route, and I think that's about it. Uh, I, actually, I take that back, there's some talk about uh, an LLM route uh, for some of these AI gateways, but um, the routes are really a family of resources that describe routing configuration for a particular host name or a particular application. And we see this in a tree format because these things actually all relate to each other. So the application developers create an HTTP route that references a gateway, and that gateway references a gateway class. And like I said, all these personas are collaborating together um, in order, to, uh, in order to, to work and thrive. And again, I'm not trying to go super deep, I'm actually a little bit deeper than I intended to, um, but this is how Gateway API is laid out at a high level. Um, there are 20 plus implementations of Gateway API, and in fact, I, that number is actually a bit old. I think it's over like 28 uh, implementations of Gateway API, from Istio to Kong to um, Nginx Fabric to cloud providers. There are so many people who are implementing Gateway API today. Uh, one of the interesting things about this as well is that it's distributed as CRDs and not built into Kubernetes. Um, this allows us to be able to add new features really, really quickly in a way that wouldn't be possible if the resource were baked into the Kubernetes um, core resources. And so we emphasize, as part of that, the, ability, uh, the focus on strongly typed fields instead of annotations. And like, this ensures that for you as users of Gateway API, whether you're reading documentation for Kong or Istio or a GCP load balancer or Azure's load balancer, the resources all look generally the same. You can learn one set of APIs and have it kind of transfer everywhere. You don't have to learn CRDs specifically for your implementations. Um, that was a very purposeful move. Um, and we still have escape hatches for implementations to have their specific logic. Um, but, you know, the, the, the uh, less frequently you have to use those, the better. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, and one of the things, because we implemented Gateway API in this way, uh, it allows you to have multi-tenant scenarios a lot better in a more secure manner. And again, there are lots of talks that go into details about that. I don't have time to get super deep there, uh, but do know that there are uh, resources like Reference Grant, and even the way that this is all laid out allows you to be more secure uh, in the way that you handle multi-tenant use cases. So. This is all great stuff, right? If you're hearing this for the first time, hopefully this is intriguing enough. Um, I may, hopefully I've made you ask some questions about how you can adopt Gateway API and how maybe this might fit in your organization. Um, so we want people to move over from Ingress to Gateway API. But there's a big problem. Who likes migrations? Does anybody? I mean, when you ask your local sysadmin or your DevOps engineer or a platform engineer or even an app, uh, an app developer who's just trying to write business logic for the application, and you say, hey, we've got a migration coming up, nobody's happy. Like, you get reactions like this, and you, just, like, and, and you see this, and I, I mean, who wants to keep spend, wasting time on, on migration? We, it's like a, we shun the word as much as possible. Um, it's like a bad word in a lot of enterprises. Unfortunately, you know, we've got this, uh, what we call an impedance mismatch, this mismatch of intentions, where we all want new features, but migrations suck. They're really painful. Um, even when done well, they require a lot of planning and thought and, and, and uh, execution, uh, even the best of circumstances. And that's all taking you away from bringing value to your business in a lot of cases. Um, if migrations go wrong, the status quo of the business is disrupted for business value that is yet unrealized. This means that there's money 
and customer trust that often that, that might get lost if your site goes down during a migration and you don't even get any of the benefits of that migration until afterward. So after the postmortem, and so after the calls with your marketing team or your PR team, and your CTO people now the CTO and the CTO gets mad at you, like all the value comes later after you've paid the cost of a disruption during a migration. And we're, ta we're not just talking about any migration here; we're talking about networking. And anybody who's been networking for a long period of time knows when the network is involved, things can get really, really hairy. The network breaks, they break, it can break in very non-obvious ways, it's difficult to fail gracefully, and it can be brutal for you and for your customer, and leave the customer feeling extremely frustrated. Let's bring this down to Gateway API specifically. If you're on Ingress today, and some dude here at KubeCon is telling you, you should migrate to Gateway API, then what you're seeing when I've tried to lay out for you is that you've got a whole different model to learn. You've got one resource for multiple resources, there is a design that is a lot more secure and allows for robust, uh, ro robust use cases and new functionality, but there's also a tad more complexity. There's a bit more if you have to wrap your head around, a bit more to go home and teach the rest of your dev team how to adopt this. Not to mention, you know, your organization might not have all the personas that Gateway API is built for. You might be a five-person shop, and your cluster admin <laughs> is also writing code is also deploying the gateways, and it's, you know, infrastructure as code, we're doing click ops over here. I, 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 you know, I don't know exactly what your scenario is, and it's different for everybody. So how do I take this, this scenario, this, this model, and make it work for a five-person dev team? Well, I think it starts with a mindset. I think every good process, every um, complex thing that we do, whether it's tech or in life generally, starts with a process. And so, um, I think that I want to you know what I want to give to you is some tools that have helped me in the past to sort of start a migration with the right mindset. And these have all been helpful for me. Hopefully, they'll be helpful for you. First, plan to succeed through failure. Again, if anybody uh, happens to pull off a 100% successful migration from zero to 100 with nothing breaking, um, first of all, they're way smarter than I am, and second of all, I don't believe them. Um, <laughs> just being honest. May happen, but it's probably, I don't think, I think it's very rare to be quite honest with you. And so, when I say plan to succeed through failure, I mean plan to fail. Plan to fail quickly, but be prepared to recover. Assume that failures are going to happen and make them as small as you possibly can. If you anticipate that things are going to break, you can create plans, contingency plans, run books, um, and you're going to approach your migration a lot, a lot more realistically than if you assume things are going to succeed. People who plan for failure know how to react. They're not going to be caught off guard when there is a page at 2 a.m. in the morning. Uh, because they anticipate that failure is going to happen. So create processes for identifying failures. I used to work as a DevOps engineer, and um, a lot of the time that we spent working with our app team, with our SREs, was around how can we detect failure as soon as possible? How can we, you know, the alerts that we had, the alert manager, uh, we didn't just go through our paging tool, we, went, we had them go to Slack, because that's where everybody was. Because we anticipate things are gonna break, we want to make sure as many people as possible saw them. So um, whatever that process looks like at your organization, um, if it, there's not one, make one, then make sure your culture uh, takes, that, takes that, sorry, make sure that process takes into account your culture. Secondly, avoid big switches. Like I said, moving from zero to 100 is going to be extremely possible to pull off well. Uh, and so if you can gradually move things, starting in a staging environment, starting in a, um, in a dev environment, or somebody's test cluster, or a POC, those are all infinitely better than just sort of YOLOing it and running out with the new thing. And again, I know this sounds a bit rudimentary, uh, but you'd be surprised how many times you can forget the fundamentals when you're excited about a new technology, or when there's pressure to deliver. Uh, or when you know, it's holiday season, uh, maybe if any of you have worked in retail or aligned with retail, uh, it's a very busy season. 
all of these things that can pop up and cause us to sort of forget the things uh, that got us here in the first place. And so these are just reminders of some of these things. Uh, third one, I love the third one because it's really relevant <laughs> sort of in this AI age, but data, data, data. Data is one of the most important tools that any of us have in making sure a migration goes smoothly. Um, confirm your observability strategy. If, if you are using Prometheus or Alert Manager or any other tool that I might not know about and pull at the, the top of my head right now, um, get to know that tool intimately. Get to know it well. Figure out how you can integrate it into places you might not think about. Because going back to that first point, when things go wrong, you need to be able to figure out what's going wrong uh, before you can figure out how to solve it. And so um, create a new observability strategy for your migration. You might already have one for you know, self, uh, uh, excuse, excuse me, incidents or whatever, what, what have you. Have one specifically for migrations. Anticipate things are gonna go wrong. Anticipate they might go wrong badly. Then figure out how you can surface them as soon as possible, maybe even before things break. Maybe things just look weird. Figure out what that data looks like and find a way to correlate it to, um, th through your tooling. Uh, with Gateway API specifically, now we're getting to some specific uh, principles here. Remember that there are multiple personas and multiple roles within Gateway API that people in your organization might correspond to. Figure out who's who. Where do you fit in, uh, in this tree structure that we were describing earlier? Where, I mean, obviously it's like where do your app devs fit, but figure out who they are in your organization. Find the names, figure out who your contacts are, figure out who is gonna be your accountable person for making these things go well. Figure out who needs to learn. A big part of a migration is gonna be the learning process. It's gonna be figuring out where the gaps in knowledge are. How do I get to talk to my app team? They're used to writing these ingress resources. How do I get them to start writing HTTP routes or TCP routes? Um, what sorts of things do they need to learn specifically? Um, go through that process um, and again, make it specific to you. Uh, I can't stretch, stress enough um, how important it is that you, when you go through this migration process, that you tailor all of the processes uh, to, to your organization. There's a reason I'm not setting up here with specific tools or specific um, A, B, C, D things to go home and do immediately because everybody's different. And so um, I've typically found principles work best. That's what I'm giving to you. So find the people in your organization um, who map these personas and um, and talk to them and figure out uh, and understand what their experience is going to be like ahead of time. Uh, and then lastly, uh, okay, I'll add the third one. Not my favorite. This is my favorite because um, it's really special to me and important to me. Leverage the community for best practices. One of the reasons that Gateway API has been able to be so successful is because we have a vibrant community of contributors, um, including our implementations, by the way. There are um, weekly Gateway API meetings that you can go to and uh, hear about the new things that we're working on in the community, um, provide your feedback as a user about things that were uh, seamless, things that made sense, and things that were intuitive, and things that were not so much so intuitive or seamless or easy for you to use. Um, we love to hear those things. They help us make better software for you. Uh, so please feel free to join those. Uh, there is, uh, I'll link to the uh, GitHub. It's uh, github.com slash Kubernetes 6 slash Gateway API. It's a great starting point. And it's got information about when we meet and all, sorts of, all those sorts of things. We also have a very active Slack channel. Um, I can't tell you how many people uh, come through and just say, hey, I'm tr having trouble getting uh, my route to work. My traffic is giving a 500 and I don't know what to do. And we just have this outpouring of people who are there who are ready to help you and who are, are really happy to help you figure out uh, how to get up and running, how to get unblocked. Um, it's a really great community and I highly recommend if you're going through this migration, talk to the community first. Um, let them fill in the blanks where you might have gaps or questions or anything I didn't get to in the 35 minute talk. Um, let us help you um, in, our, in your regular business hours. Right? I would be remiss if I didn't give you some more specific tools though. Um, principles are great and hopefully uh, you found these to be useful for you. But uh, like I said, I wanna give you some sp specific gateway API things that are gonna be even more helpful for, to you in your journey. The first one is called Ingress to Gateway. Ingress to Gateway is a, um, another project sort of within the Gateway API umbrella. 
uh, but it's got a separate repo. It's github.com slash Kubernetes 6 slash ingress to gateway. And this is a really awesome tool that our community put together because we thought that people were going to need some help moving from ingress API to gateway API. And so what it does, it translates um, ingress and even some provider-specific resources uh, to gateway API resources. It supports several providers today, um, Apisix, Ingress Nginx, Istio, uh, GCE, Kong, and OpenAPI. And the command is pretty simple. You, you install it, it's on Homebrew, you can install it from source as well. You use to ingress to gateway, uh, print. And what this does, is gonna scan your Kubernetes cluster. It's gonna look for, uh, and you have to pass in the provider, I forgot about that bit. You tell them what provider that you use. What it's gonna do, it's gonna go into your cluster, it's gonna find resources that it knows about that correspond to the provider that you passed in. I've got a demo here on the next slide that's gonna show you an Nginx use case. Um, but it's gonna go through, it's gonna find those resources, and it's gonna perform a translation for you and turn those resources into Gateway API. Uh, this is a great starting point. Um, again, I emphasize a great starting point. I wouldn't start deploying these things immediately to production uh, because you're gonna wanna validate them first. You're gonna wanna double check them, make sure they look right to you. Um, but it's a great way to see uh, what the resources should look like um, and to scaffold early a, uh, a good uh, set of resources to, like I said, start with. So here's the demo right here. I apologize, that's a little small, uh, but we're gonna do our best. I'm gonna talk you through it. So right here, uh, you're gonna see, I'm gonna describe my service. Yeah, oh wow, it's horribly small. Oh gosh, okay. Let me try to get creative here, see if maybe you can see this. See how, see how much I can zoom here. <laughs> uh, that's still pretty small. Is that, is that any better? Okay, awesome. We're gonna try to keep this going then. So, I'm gonna QPTO describe my service here, HTTP bin, and let me turn my notes down just so you all can see, oh gosh. Okay, here we go, we're just gonna scroll. All right, this is my service, my HTTP, my HTTP bin service. So I've got um, a selector, it's called HTTP bin, so let's a pod, pretty normal. Right, the service you see in Kubernetes every single day. And you're gonna notice that it's running on ports 80, uh, it's got a target port of 8080, and the service exposes a port of 8000. Then I'm going to describe the ingress resource. And here, you see the inf uh, more detailed information. Um, the address of the ingress resource, in this case, uh, I'm running this on a local cluster, so it's you know a, a random private IP address, and then I've got a simple rule here that uh, looks for a host of example.com uh, at a path prefix of slash, so anything with example.com. It's gonna forward it to my HTTP, my HTTP bin service on a port 8000, the port that's exposed. And look, it even tells me uh, what pod IPs are behind the HTTP bin service uh, on what ports. And then here, Nginx tells me that uh, the um, ingress has been synced, so I expect traffic to flow um, the way I want. Now, I'm going to run ingress to gateway the same way that I told you I was going to. Uh, excuse my inability to type. But uh, ingress to gateway, print, and then pass in a set of providers. That was really fast. We're gonna st stop here and focus. Ingress to gateway, print, uh, with providers ingress nginx. So here you can see pretty fast, actually, um, it's gonna go through my cluster. Without me telling it, it found my ingress resource and it translated it into a couple of resources. So first, we're gonna see the gateway resource. The gateway resource, like I said earlier, is gonna be the actual load balancer uh, corresponding to the compute passing packets into my cluster. We have a gateway class name of nginx. We're gonna assume that that's installed somewhere. Um, and we've got a listener. A listener corresponds to a, a, a port uh, basically that the load balancer is listening on, and uh, we've got that exposed here on port 80. 
And uh, and this for this listener specifically, we're only looking for hostname example.com. So I'm going to do a curl request here in a second. And if I don't set the host header, then the request is not going to work. Um, so it's looking for that example.com hostname. We also, yeah, I can scroll down here. We also have a route. And so while the gateway might be created by my, um, my cluster operator, this route is going to be created by an, a, an app developer who is owning the HTTP, HTTP bin service. I'm going to say that a lot this, this talk. It's going to get harder and harder each time. <laughs> um, this also has a host name on the route, and that's going to be required for validating um, that the requests that we're getting are intended for this route. It's doing uh, like host matching, like I said, and uh, it's got to be there in order for the request to succeed. Uh, we have a parent ref with a name of Nginx, and this HTTP bin parent ref corresponds to the name of the gateway up here. Uh, and then we've got rules for where to send that backend service. Uh, a, we call it a backend ref with the name of the service and the port of the service with a match that in this case is a path prefix. So see how just going from what already exists inside my cluster, ingress to gateway can translate that into gateway API specific resources for me um, with no, you know, not very much required for me at all. Let's go back into the slideshow here. Oh, goodness. Let's try this. Okay. There we go. Okay. Uh, so that's one tool. The next tool is weighted uh, DNS slash uh, traffic routing. So if you use a CDN layer in your applications, this is something you can already take advantage of. And most modern DNS providers uh, can do this as well. So um, let me say what this is. I forgot to actually describe what it was. <laughs> so m most DNS providers and CDNs can weight uh, traffic that comes to a single IP address to different backends. So uh, I'm thinking about things like Fastly, Cloudflare, AWS Route 53, Google Cloud DNS, uh, Azure DNS, and Traffic Manager. All of these things can uh, take, you can send traffic to an IP address or a host name where that CD CDN is set up. And it can uh, basically split the traffic based on percentages. Um, so what I would say, what I recommend, start with 1% to 5% of traffic going uh, to the Gateway API load balancer and monitor for errors. Um, spin up two. So spin up your ingress. You've got your ingress when that exists. Spin up a Gateway API load balancer with a different IP address. Then have a CDN that sends to both of them. 5% going to the new thing. You know, 95, 90% uh, 90 going to the new thing, or to the old thing. I may have swap, swapped that, regardless. You know what I mean. Um, remember, as well, that you're going to need to coordinate this change across security boundaries. Um, make sure that you've got uh, all the access policies um, set up correctly, uh, replicate some things. Uh, but what this is going to allow you to do is going to allow you to see, you know, once you've got your route scaffolded, once you've got... Um, your app devs kind of onboarded. This is going to allow you to actually see what it looks like to run this gateway API um, live. And you can do it, like I said, in such a way to where if something goes wrong, you can recover quickly by changing a DNS rule or changing a CDN. And depending on DNS TTLs and, and CDN propagation times, uh, you can be back up in you know five to 30 minutes, depending again, depending on some variables. Um, it also uh, lets you fail Pretty obviously, if you start seeing um, you know, 500s go up or things of that nature, if you've got data, like I said earlier, you'll find that and detect that and be able to figure out what's wrong. Uh, the goal here is to shoot for zero or near zero downtime migrations. Um, and to do that, some traffic management solution is going to be required. So I've got a diagram that sort of shows this. Let's walk through the traffic flow. So traffic's going to first hit your CDN layer or your DNS layer. In the DNS case, you're going to have um, multiple, you know, two A records, and you're going to tell your um, DNS provider, again, AWS, GCP, what have you, to send, you know, X percent to one and another percent to another. The CDN, you have more, bit more fine grained control, but it's basically the same deal. So your traffic's going to hit that IP address, and then it's going to flow down to uh, your ingress uh, load balancer, your gateway API load balancer. 
And then it's going to flow down to your backend pods. Um, it's going to be the same set of backend pods, which gives you a really a real world view into what this is going to look like when you're at 100% running with Gateway API. Um, again, probably is better to start this in like sta a staging environment first. Um, but even in, in production, you are rolling this out for the first time in prod. You can run um, a set percentage from one to the other and see uh, and see how it performs. So it went a little bit faster, but that, that's really all I've got. Um, if you've got questions, we've got a couple of mics here in the center. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much for your attention. Um, I'll be around the conference the rest of the week. Um, feel free to come and find me. Thank you.